total population of Indonesia in 2020 was projected to reach 270.2 million. According to gender, this number consists of 136 million men and 133 million women. Data Globacon 2020 reveals that breast cancer is the highest among new female cancer cases of all ages in Indonesia, which is equal to 30.8% or 65,858 of the total 213,546 new female cancer cases. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death after lung cancer in Indonesia. 70% of breast cancer patients have been directed or come to the hospital in advanced stages when the chance of cure and survivorships is lower. Ironically, if breast cancer is found at an early stage, life expectancy will be higher. Breast cancer is the type of cancer most commonly affects women. However, men can also be affected by this disease. Although the proportion is very small, breast cancer in men is generally malignant. The Indonesian Breast Cancer Foundation or IBCF was established in 2003, initially named Jakarta Breast Health Foundation. It has been changed its name to IBCF in 2014. It is a non-profit foundation founded by breast cancer survivors, an oncologist and a volunteer. IBCF has a vision that Indonesia will be free from advanced breast cancer and its missions are early detection of breast cancer should be part of the general checkup. Breast cancer early detection services should be done by all hospitals. The outreach of breast cancer awareness to as many communities in Indonesia will be carried out by well-trained health workers and volunteers. Breast cancer survivors can still exist in their respective fields. The main goals of IBCF are to reduce the incidence of advanced breast cancer, to increase public awareness and knowledge of breast cancer, to find breast cancer at an early stage. The founders of IBCF are Linda Agun Gumalan, Tati A.M. Henro Priono, Andi Enriartono Sutarto, Rima Melati Tumuan, and the late Dr. Suchipto, oncologist. In September 2014, IBCF was accepted as a full member of Reach to Recovery International or RRI. And in November 2016, IBCF became a full member of the Union of International Cancer Control or UICC with a strong and consistent commitment to reducing the incidence of advanced breast cancer in Indonesia. At the commemoration of National Health Day 2020, the IBCF as a non-profit organization received an award from the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Indonesia for its consistent efforts in promoting the National Healthy Living Program or GERMAS in the category of prevention and control of non-communicable diseases in Indonesia. In order to implement its missions, IBCF has five programs which are Mobile Mammography Unit IBCF in accordance with IBCF's mission, which is to reduce the incidence of advanced stage breast cancer, from 2005 to 2014, IBCF, in cooperation with the National Cancer Center Dharma Is Hospital, operated the first and only analog system mobile mammography unit in Indonesia in carrying out breast screening for underprivileged women in Jakarta and its vicinities. Since 2015, IBCF has operated a digital system mobile mammography unit. Data from Breast Mammography Screening Program through the IBCF Mobile Mammography Unit are as follows. From 2015 to June 2021, the number of women being breast screened are 14,759 women. The number of women with benign tumor are 2,264 women or 15.3%. The number of women with suspicion of a malignant tumor are 254 women or 1.7%. Promotion and Education About Breast Screening and Breast Cancer Early Detection As an effort to promote early detection of breast cancer in Indonesia, IBCF collaborates with various women communities in the regions, high schools, universities, print and electronic media, and conducts promotion of early detection of breast cancer to remote areas of the country. Practical Training for Breast Self-Examination 
Through practical training for breast self-examination, IBCF wants to reach as many people on how to do early detection of breast cancer, which can be done by breast self-examination at home. This training program, which was conducted in 2019, has been participated by 573 participants. The trained participants have now passed on the information about the importance of breast self-examination to various women community groups in their areas. Breast Cancer Peer Support Volunteers Training Program with two Rhineland Certificate. Since 2015, IBCF has conducted Breast Cancer Peer Supports Training Program with two Rhineland Certificate. These breast cancer peer supporters have been given the basic knowledge about breast cancer, how to better communicate with breast cancer patients, and also cultural sensitivity and psychological aspects. IBCF Shelter in order to improve its vision and mission, since 2017, the IBCF provided the IBCF Shelter House for Breast Cancer Outpatients who are members of the National Health Coverage or BPJS Class 3 participants with a capacity that can accommodate as many as 28 beds for residents. The existence of the IBCF Shelter greatly helps breast cancer patients undergo continuous medical therapy such as chemotherapy and radiation at the cancer hospitals. To further optimize organizational performance, IBCF forms three pillars. The pillars of the breast cancer survivors community consisting of IBCF breast cancer survivor Dian and IBCF breast cancer survivor Kartika. IBCF peer support pillar. Pillar of breast cancer peer support volunteers at the Darmais Cancer Hospital. You can be part of the successful completion of all IBCF programs. To donate, please transfer your funds to the following accounts. Let's support IBCF in achieving its vision, Indonesia free of advanced stage of breast cancer. Indonesian Breast Cancer Foundation, Saling Jaga, Saling Paduli. Show you care, be aware. Good afternoon. Selamat siang. Welcome back to CBEX 2021. We are currently entering our session three of the day. The title is Communicating with Your Doctor. And now I would like to invite President of Breast Cancer Welfare Association, Taur, who will be the moderator for the session. Thank you. Thank you, Gadis, for introducing me. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I know we are from different parts of the world and we all at different timings. But, uh, you know, due to the COVID situation, none of us could come together to Indonesia. I'm in Malaysia and we have people from different parts of the world. Uh, so what we decided to do was to have a session uh, organized by the Advanced Breast Cancer Global Alliance and Malaysia, Malaysian Breast Cancer Welfare Association. And the topic is communicating with your doctor. We think that this point is very important for us to have a session like this because the, the very gist of how you message your information to the doctor, how you describe things, the language, and also the tone of voice, the nonverbal communication between the doctor and the patient, and at the same time, many other factors that need to be considered when we are having this communication experience to ensure that it is a positive and a productive one. Today we have a very good team of speakers, experts in this area in communication, mostly through professional experience as well as through personal and family experience. So before I start with these speakers, I would like to first introduce uh, to us uh, how the whole session is going to be held. We're going to have each speaker speaking for 15 minutes, followed by questions and answers. And you can write, key in your questions if you have any during the session. And we will read out the questions so that we can forward it to the panel. So I would like to say hello to all my fellow speakers, Lucia and Ibella, and also um, 
We have Rania Azmi who will be joining us soon. Uh, we have to, in order to start with, we have a very eminent person who would be giving a welcome speech, a welcome message to all of us regarding this particular session. Do we have the uh, CV, Dr. Fatima Cardoso CV to come up? Or oh, yes, that's right. So Dr. Fatima Cardoso, she is first of all president of the ABC Global Alliance or the Advanced Breast Cancer Global Alliance, who has moved mountains in many parts of the world. She is also the director of the breast unit of Champalimont. Uh, clinical center in Lisbon, Portugal. So it's the same place as Lucia's working place, I think. And uh, her educational background is medical doctor, and she has had fellowships in translational research unit of the Jules Bullet Institute in Brussels, Belgium. She's uh, had fellowships in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Oncology at the MDC, MD Anderson Center in Houston, Texas. Her job experience is she's been a director in the breast unit, as I mentioned, in Champalimont uh, Clinical Center in Lisbon, president of ABC Global Alliance, assistant professor at the Medical Oncology Clinic in IJB, and scientific director of the International Research Network, Transbig. And she is also committee member for ESMO, ESO, EOT, EORTC, ASCO, and AACR. She's a board member of SMO, ECCO, and EORTC. And lastly, she's also editor-in-chief of the Breast Journal. So let's welcome Dr. Fatima Cardoso, who is going to give us her welcome message. Hello, everyone. My name is Fatima Cardoso, and I'm a medical oncologist, the director of the Breast Unit at the Champalimont Clinical Center in Lisbon, and also the president of the Global Alliance, the ABC Global Alliance. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this session uh, run as a collaboration between the ABC Global Alliance and the Breast Cancer Welfare Association Malaysia. And we're gonna focus on communicating with your doctor. And it's crucial that issue, issues of communication are crucial for the management of advanced or metastatic disease. I would like to share uh, some uh, notes with you, some introductory notes. I won't take long and leave you to the very important session that you have in front of you. But I'm just explaining to you what is the Global Alliance, why we have created a Global Alliance against advanced or metastatic breast cancer, and this is because there's so much to do still worldwide regarding this disease. What you see here is the evolution of the outcome for advanced breast cancer. And in the upper part of your slide, you see that the percentage of patients that are alive at five years is only 25%, so one out of four. And in the, a decade time, which is the report uh, that you see there, it improved from 23 to 25%. So really almost no improve in a decade. And at the bottom of your slide, you see real world data coming from France where the medium survival of this disease from 2008 to 2013 remains basically the same around three years. So there's still so much to do for this disease. We also know that this disease it can occur de novo, so the diagnosis can be already as metastatic disease, or it can be recurrent, meaning that you have early breast cancer, and then after a few years, there is a relapse and metastatic disease appears. And de novo breast cancer has a, a better survival because no treatment has ever been given. But for the recurrent, where a lot of treatments were given in the early setting, it becomes even more difficult to treat this cancer in the metastatic setting. We also know that the patients with this disease feel isolated. On the upper part of your slide, you see two very important surveys that I'd advise you to read. They are freely available online, the Bridge Survey and the Silent Voices that were, were done in the beginning of the 2000s, showing that these patients feel abandoned by all, by healthcare professionals, by researchers, by media, by government, 
and even by the patient advocacy groups that focus on early disease. And they feel also guilty as if it was their fault that metastases have occurred. And they also don't feel at ease to speak about it. This is, these surveys were the ones that made us start this effort, creating a dedicated consensus conference, dedicated guidelines, and fighting for the needs of these patients. Then you fast forward 10 years and you have the survey done uh, in 2016 on the bottom of your slide. And you see that things have improved, but there's still so much to do. About 63% still finds that nobody understands what they are going through. Uh, they also feel isolated, that, that the society sees them negatively and that they feel that it's hard to find support. So this is the reason why we created the Alliance. So what is the Alliance? The Alliance is like a platform where all types of stakeholders can come together and share. That is the most important word for the Alliance. Collaborate, share resources and knowledge. And you see those are our members currently in many different countries around the world, including, including a lot of Asian Pacific countries. And please go to the website to see the projects that we are doing and the resources that are there freely available for you to use. The first thing we did was to define goals. And this is called the ABC Global Charter with 10 goals for this current decade we are living in. And we want to improve from uh, survival, of course, that it's no longer just three years, uh, improve quality of life, improve data, improve communication, which is the one we are going to tackle today in this session, but also improve accessibility, access to work, and fighting stigma. So today we will focus on this goal number five, improve communication between healthcare professionals and patients. So this is the, the, the agenda of today. Uh, we will have uh, Dr. Lucia Travado setting the scene on how important it is to communicate with the doctor. We also will have uh, Rania Amsi to discuss uh, how to talk with the doctor. Um, what, how could family members talk to the doctor on behalf of the patient? And then we will have Ebele uh, giving us some examples of challenges facing by metastatic breast cancer patients in communicating with uh, uh, healthcare professionals. And Abeli Mabnugo comes from Nigeria, focusing on issues from the, that region, but they unfortunately are common all over the world. And the session will be moderated by Ranjit Kaur, and she will also give the closing remarks. So finally, I just wanted to tell you that if you wanna know more about how to treat this disease, please go into uh, the conference website, which is www.abc lisbon.org. You'll find the guidelines and you'll find also many other resources that are very useful. And please remember that we all have to unite to treat according to the guidelines because it improves survival and improves quality of life of uh, the patients with this disease. So finally, I would like to invite you to join us for the ABC6 conference that unfortunately due to the pandemic will have to be run virtually this year. It will be during four and six of November. And please go and, and double check because there are registration grants available and we hope that many of you can join us uh, during this conference. Before I leave you to the session, I will come back to goal number nine about fighting stigma. And I would like to share with you an awareness campaign video, which is very short and will provide you uh, everything that is most important to say about stigma for metastatic or advanced disease through uh, the words of the patients. So let's hear the video. It sometimes feels like uh, a price is being put on our life and that isn't right. They just look at you as 
a walking corpse. You know, I am living the, probably their worst nightmare. It is treated like a curse. They can't understand that there's no, no happy ending, no, uh, no getting better. No, let's not use the money for treatment because she's going to die anyway. Thinking about my kids is difficult. I am advanced breast cancer. Thank you very much for listening and please enjoy the session. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Fatima Caduso for, for being so kind as to give this welcome message. And you can see towards the end of it, it's very powerful messages coming from people who have advanced breast cancer. Uh, welcome, uh, Rania. I see you now. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. We move on to the next uh, person who is going to give a very powerful message to us. And she is none other than Lucia Travado. She's a clinical a clinician and researcher of psycho-oncology of Champalimot uh, Clinical and Research Center, uh, which is part of the Champalimot Foundation in uh, Lisbon in uh, Portugal. And uh, she has, you'll be surprised, she looks young. She has 35 years of experience in psycho psychosocial aspects. And she actually has been one of the pioneers, uh, particularly looking into patients uh, with chronic uh, diseases such as cancer. Uh, and particularly cancers, and she's been active in the European initiatives regarding improvement of European cancer policies to include psychosocial care in cancer patients' treatment to improve their outcomes. So she brings in this very important part which patients actually face and which are not sometimes paid attention to during whether it is during diagnosis or whether it is during treatment. And um, I... I you know, Lucia, we need you in this part of the world. So uh, what, what we would like to see is, I mean, she's somebody who was previously president of the International Psycho-Oncology Society, IPOS, and she's currently the president emeritus, which is a very, uh, I would say, a very eminent position. And uh, you are the ex one of the very few experts in this field in the world and we really look forward to your talk, which is going to be setting the scene on the importance of communication with the doctor. Over to you, Lucia. Hello, everyone. It is my big pleasure to be here with you today to speak on this important topic of communicating with your doctor. I'm Lucia Travado, and I would like to greet Ranjit Kaur, my, the chair of this uh, workshop. Um, I have to tell you that I usually give um, communication skills training for doctors. So it is a big pleasure to be here with you. And, and I understand that the audience is mostly patients, survivors, NGOs, and to speak from the other side and how to help you best communicate with your doctor. So, uh, in 2019, uh, the Advanced Breast Cancer Conference that is held in Lisbon by my colleague, uh, Dr. Fatima Cardozo, who I work with at the breast um, unit of the Champalimo Cancer Center, um, has put down this patient advocate statement, which I think says a lot about how patients would like to be uh, treated and their relationship that they would like to have with their 
doctors and their healthcare providers. So I would just point out some, you can see it, I just point out some of the main aspects. So they state that, please give your patients the opportunity to talk and get to know them with their fears, desires, and hopes. Make us your partner in the fight against cancer. Ask us how we are feeling, how we are coping coping with the therapy. therapy. Put yourself in our position and try to understand our needs and vulnerabilities. We know that our disease also represents a challenge for the physician. And I think this is a beautiful statement that indicates how communication is important from the patient's side um, to with their doctors and also that um, patients are asking their doctors not only to be the best doctors using their best ep- expertise to treat them, but also they need their humanity and a relationship with the, them as whole persons with their own um, idiosyncrasies and personalities. And this in fact says that communication is one of the most important things in the relationship with your doctor and your healthcare providers. And it's indeed a critical factor for the quality of care that you receive. Uh, Studies have shown that the way in which healthcare professionals communicate with you has implications for the quality of the relationship you have with your doctor, the patient's adjustment, a patient's satisfaction, also professional satisfaction because it has been shown that it reduces burnout and also it reduces healthcare costs. So good communication skills facilitate addressing patients' concerns and needs, provide basic emotional support, and helps to detect how you are doing emotionally and tailor the treatment and care tailored to you as a person with the disease, but who has uh, your specific specificities. Good communication skills have also been linked to higher patient satisfaction, greater patient compliance to treatment, better patient health outcomes, reduced patient anxiety, and so on. So very important aspects not to be neglected. It it is directly related with your clinical outcomes. Um, So that's why it has been placed such emphasis on this communication. But what does really happen on the consultation? The the consultation is a clinical encounter, is a dialectic between the doctor and the patient as two people. So the doctor brings his or her agenda with her knowledge and how uh, to treat the disease and understanding of the disease. And the patient brings her own expectations and her own agenda. And it's about her own life. And so she needs to um, uh, express also that. And the clinical encounter should be a dialogue and not a monologue. So both of you should put on the table what is uh, on the, at question. So the doctor explaining to the patient what is, is going on and also the patient contributing with, by expressing their preferences, needs, concerns, doubts, and expectations, so that the result of this clinical encounter can uh, be best for uh, the patient and also the doctor. Um, As I've said, there is a whole range of scientific evidence that indicates that if this communication from both sides goes well, so uh, the active role on good communication skills by the side of the doctor, as well as an active role from the side of the patient with uh, uh, in the, under the umbrella of a good, uh, health, well-organized service, uh, you are likely to have a better 
patient-centered care, a better communication, and a bad clinical outcome. So communication is at the core of all this because it influences how things develop and happen and how it can be facilitated, the whole process for you. So that's why doctors have placed now a big emphasis on training, on the communication skills training. And as you can see, uh, recently, this has been placed, the communication skills training have been placed on the medical oncology curriculum so that they can improve their way of communicating and uh, improving their relationship with their patients. They have been placed guidelines and explanations about how to conduct this, how to do that, specific workshops for doctors to train those skills. As I've mentioned, I, I am used to do that. Also protocols to help doctors on how to deliver bad news because um, many times in cancer care, there are situations that requires that. And this is not um, nice for the doctor to have to tell you this, neither for you to receive those news. So uh, this protocol is uh, one of the most well-known one. And it says here that the doctor has to undergo these different steps to understand what you already know, but also when um, the bad news are stated to also help you uh, uh, with empathy, uh, reacting with their humanity to the situation that is difficult for you. But what can you do to help this clinical encounter and this relationship uh, to be at its best, to optimize it. So you also have a role. And as in any relationship, uh, even with your friends, your husband, your dog, daughter, your parents, you can either have an active role or a passive one. And we know that if you have a passive one, your needs are likely not to be uh, taken into consideration. So it's best that you also uh, have an active role and really feel empowered to do that. It's your right to participate in that clinical consultation and bring yourself and your needs and concerns to the table so that you can help your doctor to help you the best at his ability in the process of undergoing the treatment uh, and which we know it's difficult, uh, a very difficult situation that you are enduring and very challenging for you. So please take action and that's your role. Ask what you need, inform your healthcare professionals about how your preferences and concerns. There are many resources to help patients in asking useful questions from their doctors. I listed just a few. I also photoed some of the websites that goes from cancer centers to NGOs that almost all of them have a file with what can you ask uh, your doctor to be better informed. Um, metastatic breast cancer, questions to ask the healthcare team. They give examples of what can you ask. And this organization, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, one of many, that motivates really patients to take this active role. And uh, by saying that maintaining good communication with your providers allows you to be a collaborative partner. And by sharing information, you can uh, also participate in the decision-making process, which may increase the quality of care you receive and can help you reach greater emotional well-being and clinical outcomes. So it's up to you to also help your doc doctor reaching out back to uh, clinical outcomes by taking an active role as well from your side. 
these uh, websites even go further on giving you uh, tips on how to improve conversation with providers. Very specific examples. What can you do that may improve the communication? So for instance, bringing written questions to guide you. Um, and they say, there are no dumb questions. So ask anything that you feel the need to ask. Make the conversation, the consultation, a dialogue. Talk, listen, and make it a, a two-way flow. If you don't understand what is being said, please ask. And they give examples. Try, for instance, could you please go over that again a little more slowly? Um, ask for information that you do not uh, uh, understand and also repeat back the information to understand if you are have understood well. Also bring a friend or a relative or your loved one to the consultation so that you can then um, dialogue with him or her to understand better what has happened in the consultation. So many tips that can help you uh, improve your conversation at the consultation. There are even nowadays websites and platforms with many information for uh, you as a patient uh, in different aspects, as, uh, as you can see here, uh, specifically for metastatic breast cancer patients uh, and conducted by breast cancer patients. And there is this one um, that uh, has been adapted by a Malaysian uh, organization. And also in Portugal, I have participated in this adaptation of this uh, um, booklet, which is also um, on display at the website. So to finalize the message I would like you to take home is that communication is indeed a key factor in improving your clinical outcomes. Uh, a communication is a double way, way process in which you have a role and that you need to be more active uh, to participate in the clinical encounter by preparing with questions and creating this partnership with your doctor, taking your role and feel empowered to ask the questions you need, because if you don't ask, you are likely not to have an answer and you have the right to do it because it's all about you and your life. And if, by doing this, you help your doctor to understanding you better, what you need, what are your concerns and preferences, and taking this active role in the communication with your doctor may help you in keeping a better control of your life and needs and participate in the shared decision-making process, have a better quality of life, and better regulate your expectations of the care you receive and what is happening. I know that you can do it. Yes, you can. So please do it. And I thank you very much for your attention and wish you all the best for your life. And please take action. It's all about you and you are entitled to also participate in this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucia. I didn't know it was going to be so dramatic with music. <laughs> I almost started speaking just now. Uh, thank you very much, Lucia, for speaking and, and, and for giving uh, so much information in, in a nutshell uh, within just a few minutes. Now we move on to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Rania Azmi. Rania is from uh, Kuwait. She is the president of Fadia Survive and Thrive. And um, she has actually has been having a uh, uh, 10 years of experience being a patient advocate uh, and she works uh, in the area of cancer patient advocacy, cancer prevention and cancer control at the same time promoting, supporting and elevating cancer therapy side effects while focusing on improving patients quality of life by putting evidence-based knowledge into practice. 
she uh, her organization which is Fadia Survive and Thrive is also an, a UICC member a member of the ABC Global Alliance and the World Patient Alliance so before I introduce uh, before I get Rania to speak I would like to inform everyone and remind everyone use the Slido to put in your questions for the speakers who will give the answers and also discuss answers at the end of this session so I would like to bring to you Rania Azmi from Kuwait and she's to speak on conversation with the doctor by family members on behalf of the advanced breast cancer patient we know that in many of our countries conversations are not just between patient and the doctor but also with the family so Rania this is really an important topic for you to speak on and we are really welcoming you warmly to us sorry you can't be in indonesia it has to be done online i i would have loved that thank you so much for for the kind introduction thank you for the south east asia breast cancer symposium and the abc global alliance for having me it's really an important topic and as patient advocates we could not emphasize it more uh, so I'm, I'm very thrilled to be with you actually to to discuss it uh, and i have uh, some uh, uh, interesting information to um, to stimulate a little bit uh, uh, thoughts both ways uh, if, if if we can consider it both ways between oncologists and patients but it's more than that for other stakeholders uh, in the cancer industry so um, i'm going to take you in that journey um, uh, of, of this. Uh, next, please, for the slides. Um, and to be able to discuss with you the conversation with the doctor by family members on behalf of the advanced breast cancer patient, uh, I will go through three main uh, uh, subtitles uh, uh, for you uh, to thoroughly get the bigger picture of this. So uh, at the beginning, I, I will start with what what are the ABC patients and their family or caregivers needs and then would emphasize what the cons, uh, cons, um, uh, conversation or communication gaps that exist in reality uh, from our observation from evidence from research there are uh, many um, uh, information out there and uh, the, the needs uh, of the patients also uh, having the, the higher priority in discussing this. And lastly, what can be done to bridge the gaps that exist for positive and productive conversation between oncologists and patients? So if we start with uh, the first uh, uh, part of this uh, uh, talk about the ABC patients and their family caregivers uh, and their caregivers needs, uh, cancer uh, is a complex disease. So improving the communication and conversation obviously would not take away this complexity but it would make the life much easier for everyone uh, also um, for the patient in any part uh, or any uh, stop in their journey uh, they would face different challenges and different pains please the next uh, picture uh, next couple of pictures and the next one as well so in, in the cancer control, there's uh, the, the prevention, uh, the diagnostics, uh, then treatment, and then palliative care. And in every, in every phase in the cancer journey, there are different challenges. Um, and I would emphasize the challenges uh, in communication and also what the patient and the, their family side face in terms of pain. Next slide, please. Pain is... Um, I would say in different parts of the world are uh, treated differently. Some oncologists are proactive in addressing them and others are after the fact. There are many complications related to side effects as well. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very delicate issue to discuss in, in a very short time, but uh, for advanced breast cancer patients specifically, most probably some of the advanced anti-cancer agents would cause side effects that can be confused with life-threatening cases like sepsis. So you have to deal with multiple layers of, uh, of happenings with the patients like pain, side effects from the drug, uh, impaired quality of life, and sometimes 
symptoms that can be for life-threatening complications of cancer. So, you know, all of this need, needs awareness on the family uh, member's side or caregivers for the patient to be alerted to these kind of issues and be able to communicate them. So there will be no effective communication without that awareness. So I would say that there, there is a huge uh, challenge from the patient side to recognize these issues and that they need to be brought to the attention of the oncologist on one hand. And even if they are aware of it, the complexity of having multiple um, challenges and pain and side effects would make that communication uh, very complex. Next slide, please. So the most important uh, part in, 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 in recognizing the needs for a patient is, is to listen to them. Uh, and that starts with the family members and caregivers. Because most of the time, like what happens with the patient, there is a phase where everyone will be in denial. Like this is not happening. Or even if that side effect is there and that pain is there, um, there will be a denial that it's not that fatal. It's just a normal side effect of the drug and uh, the patient is going to be fine. They look fine. These sort of things uh, really need to be uh, addressed. Um, I wouldn't say extremely scientific, but it has to be based on science because otherwise there are many noise out there of, of what needs to be done and, and, and how to feel. Next. So for, for the quality of life, if I talk about what needs uh, in terms of quality of life for patients, uh, that would take a couple of hours. But just in a nutshell, one, one of the basic things is to be able to sleep. Most of ABC patients, and I'm, and I'm sure there are some uh, research that discussed that already, they lack sleep for many reasons, the, 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 the drugs, uh, for treating the cancer, the cancer itself, uh, the side effects, uh, long-term and short-term, uh, the, the appetite and the quality of food they get. And I wouldn't say food, I would say the quality of nutrients. Do they get enough nutrients? And how this is observed, uh, monitored, and addressed. Because the, these certain aspects of quality of life, sleeping, food, uh, movement, um, taking care of other aspects of life other than cancer, unfortunately, in some cultures are considered acceptable casualty. Um, and again, in some research and in some uh, cases, they can be the defining factor between um, survival, it, like longer survival, and not only longer survival, better quality of life, if, if these other factors uh, taken care of. And, and one of important aspects of the quality of life uh, as well is uh, making sure that uh, any food or, or, or any uh, treatment for the ABC patients, especially elderly, is done in a, in a hygienic standard. And we cannot emphasize this more now with the pandemic era. Next, please. So with this, we can move to the next uh, uh, part about the communication gaps. I just needed to give you like a quick overview about uh, the needs for patients and their uh, family members. It's mostly, again, just to summarize, related to how to improve quality of life in its bigger, um, bigger picture and how to minimize uh, the pain as much as possible because we recognize that it's, it, it's uh, in, in metastatic setting, uh, the disease, unfortunately, is uh, not um, curable, uh, but it's manageable. So in, in communication gaps, uh, there are several gaps that can exist, uh, but I would uh, emphasize here three main gaps. Next, please. Uh, these are the power gap, attention gap, and advice gap. And I would discuss what we mean by uh, these three types of gaps in terms of communication between oncologists um, uh, and uh, uh, patients, uh, patients slash family members or caregivers, because sometimes the patients are, th that's something also that's integral to the issue of communication that not all patients are the same. Some patients will be outspoken. They can speak for themselves. They, they have this clarity and peace of what is it that they want but others would be the very shy person 
um, that would keep all the feelings for themselves, even they would hide it from their own family, not to mention their doctor. So we need to recognize these differences in personalities, which uh, being diagnosed with cancer would not uh, change that personality. That what I recognize the hard way as a patient advocate early on. So to start with the power gap, next please. The power gap is basically that um, if you have the communication, it's two ways, oncologist and patient. On, on one hand, the oncologists have this power of knowledge, everything about the disease, scientifically, uh, clinically, you name it. And in the other side, you have the patient, it's their first ever um, case with cancer, like because they got diagnosed with cancer or if, if they got diagnosed with metastatic cancer, similar story. Uh, but for oncologists, it, it's, it could be the hundredth case or the thou number thousand, uh, hundred seventieth case, it, it, you name it. Um, what I'm trying to say, it's, um, and, and this is a, an analogy I gave in, in one of the conferences, if you have a lion running after a, a rabbit, um, uh, who would win this race? Like, um, uh, who would be faster in running? Well, in, in the wildlife, we can see uh, the lion faster or the rapid is faster, but the analogy here with due respect to, to, to both uh, sides that oncologists are, uh, might be like the lion running for another meal, like uh, it's, it's their job, but for patients, they are running for their life. So it's extremely serious and the way they perceive it, and I would highlight the word perceiving, the way it's perceived that they are powerless because they don't know the information. Uh, and, and that's why I appreciated the previous uh, presentations that yes, we need to encourage patients to ask and their family uh, caregivers and family members to ask more questions. Uh, but more fundamentally, uh, this power of knowledge need to be shared uh, and uh, I will discuss in, in the third and last part of this presentation how this, can, this power uh, gap can be bridged. So uh, let's discuss the idea of the next uh, power gap, uh, next please, which is about attention. So uh, 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 as opposed to the power gap and the attention gap, all the attention in the world is focused from the patient side to the oncologist. Like it has been um, reported in many research and also by observation and, and uh, uh, a large evidence suggests that patients would, would focus, over focus in every single thing that their oncologists say, uh, even their gesture, their body language, they would milk any single information from that conversation, even if it's, uh, if it's said out of errors or, uh, or, or if it includes some manners in some cases, like extreme cases. Uh, on the other side of the coin, the oncologists are doing their routine job. And to tell you the truth, they are not required to give that extreme attention like the way the patient is giving because that would cloud their judgment. They will be emotionally involved. So how to balance this attention gap? Again, we will discuss this in, in the last part. Uh, and uh, next, please, the last uh, um, uh, communication gap that I would discuss today is about the advice gap. We are living in a, in a I would call it a switch on society. Information are everywhere. Um, and I, I don't believe that more information is better, especially in current era, because it can provide more noise than direction. And that provides extra challenge and pressure on the time of oncologists I recognize this as a patient advocate, but that doesn't wipe away the concerns, the questions, the amount of inquiries that the patients and the caregivers might have from these open sources information uh, about that herbal or that treatment or this alternative medicine, especially in the talk of integrative oncology uh, and uh, some uh, evidence coming up about uh, you know, alternative oncology. So who would be number one reference for family members, caregivers, or patients? It's, it's always uh, unconsciously the oncologist or the treating doctor. Uh, 
So they would come to the doctor and the doctor has no idea about this. Uh, could be an evidence-based information or could, and, or can be, uh, I would call it Mickey Mouse information, like something commercial in one of the blogs. But again, they, they look at the, the oncologist as the reference for that. So that's uh, what I call the advice gap, uh, according to, to some research. Next, please. So if we move to the last part is how to bridge these gaps for productive conversation, recognizing the needs on one hand and recognizing that these gaps exist at least as perceived by patients. Next. So first uh, and foremost is it would need a collaboration and compromises from both sides. Next, please. Um, the way uh, any communication gap can be bridged is to share open conversation, is to uh, highlight and recognize what is it that I want and I demand from that com com communication. And that perhaps can be uh, the role of uh, NGOs in, in the cancer space or patient advocate to bridge that gap as much as possible because uh, patients on one hand, they have their convictions or perceptions and oncologists have their limitation on time and everything. Uh, so uh, for the power gap, uh, oncologists putting themselves in, in the shoes of the patients, and I'm not suggesting that, that, that this doesn't happen. It happens in different degrees, but it needs to be highlighted and focused over and over. Do the doctors should ask themselves, do, am I making decisions that are the patient's decisions to make? because I know more than the, the patient, so it's no brainer to take the decision on their behalf. But the, the, the better way for communication is to put forward this information to patients and em empower them to take the decision themselves. And, and instead of taking the decision because I know it all, that's for the power gap. For the attention gap, I, it's, it's not required to, uh, to uh, give, um, it's not a game to give similar attention to the patients because it would be humanly impossible to give similar attention. The patient is just one case as we agreed and for the oncologist could be hundreds of cases. What's Sorry, required... you're, you're over time, so you might want to conclude your talk. Yeah, one minute. <laughs> so it's, um, um, it, it would be just as simple as uh, that, putting themselves in the shoes of, of the patients uh, and uh, really recognize uh, how they feel and, and their pain. Next slide, please. Um, and, and that's basically, next. And you can move faster <laughs> in the one minute. So it just in the, the science color glasses of oncologists, they talk about progression-free survival and everything evidence-based. On the other hand, the patients would see that as when my pain will be over, even the emotional one. And that's that's need to be recognized just as, as you see in this following slides. Next. Uh, and uh, there is something related to the quality of life. And again, it can be bridged by discussing it. Next. And most importantly, as I mentioned earlier, the complications related to the disease uh, and how it can be confused side effects with life threatening uh, cases like sepsis that need to be bridged by awareness and information. Next. And that's really the last slide, uh, just to recognize that oncologists and patients are in this journey and patients, caregivers, oncologists, we all don't know when and where the cancer will return. So let's just be companions in this journey and try to communicate as much as possible because it would improve the quality of life physically before emotionally, um, really. Thank you. Thank you, Rania. Thank you very much. Uh, now Okay, we were supposed to move with that music, you know, so that we're not stationary all the time. Um, I'd like to introduce another good old friend of mine, Ibella Mbanugo, who is from Nigeria. Ibella, I still can, I can still pronounce your, word, your name. Ibella okay, Mbanugo. Okay. And she's the founder and CEO of the Run for a Cure Africa Breast Cancer Foundation. And this happened uh, after she experienced her mother's battle with breast cancer and she found RFCA. 
and her organization looks into providing free breast cancer screening to underserved women in Nigeria. And this program has actually grown to organizations in different places, including Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon. And uh, it has provided uh, free breast screening to over 14,000 women and also uh, and men throughout the West and Central Africa. And, um, and it's, it's tremendous. But, but the thing that we recognize, uh, the other thing that we recognize Sibella for is that uh, she's very much into the educational and, and discipline area of work. And so uh, she actually has a bachelor in psychology and a master in educational administration and a doctorate in education from Nova Southeast, Southeastern University. However, today we will have Ibella Mwadugo speak on examples of overcoming challenges faced by MBC patients in common, uh, in communication with healthcare professionals. And she has tremendous amount of experience in this area, particularly coming from the African region, which is not very different from Southeast Asian region when it comes to communication between patients and, and, and doctors. And uh, just let me remind everybody, use the QR code to scan if you have any questions to ask and do put in your questions for us. Thank you. And over to you, Ibella. Okay, thank you, Ranji, for a wonderful um, introduction. I'm very happy to be here with all my uh, Malaysian, Indonesian uh, brothers and sisters. I'm currently in the U.S., so it is about around 3.30 in the morning, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be here, so thank you for having me. Uh, this is a very important topic because what we find is, is this is where the gaps are formed and this is where they increase as far as comprehensive management for MBC patients. And so today I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we see in uh, West Africa. And I'm sure that we will be able to draw a lot of comparisons um, to the situations in, in Asia as well. Next slide, please. So uh, let me set the stage and give you some frame of reference as far as what does MBC uh, look like in Nigeria and, and basically throughout Africa. 50% of the women that are diagnosed are diagnosed at stage four. So um, a majority of our patients are presenting very late um, in the disease continuum. And so already we have that challenge of, of late presentation. Uh, there are so many issues that cause late presentation from taboo to lack of access to screenings, to lack of access to proper facilities for treatment, and then just general fear. And then what we find with a lot of our MBC patients is that they lack the confidence to play an active role in their disease journey. Again, to give you some background, we have a very small number of oncologists, uh, licensed oncologists in Nigeria. Currently, we have just under 100 oncology, oncologists for a nation of 200 million people. And when you juxtapose that to the United States, you see that they have over 20,000. So we have barely uh, 100 oncologists. And so already there you have a, a huge uh, gap in regards to the time, of, the time an oncologist can spend explaining uh, the disease, a diagnosis to a patient because they simply are over, overwhelmed with patients. So again, that contributes to some of the challenges that we, we see as far as um, communication is concerned. Putting that into uh, full focus, you'll find that a lot of patients play a very passive role because of that reason. They come in, they see their oncologist, and essentially they're being rushed through their appointment because the oncologist might have 35 other patients that they have to see that day. And naturally, they do, they do not want to uh, stress their oncologist. They don't want to anger their oncologist. So they, they play a passive role. Whatever the oncologist tells them, they simply agree and move forward. They don't ask any questions. And though they have them, they, they simply do not ask them. 
And so we were given a grant from UICC in 2017, and it was to create a support group for MBC patients. And in our first meeting with uh, over 26 MBC patients, the first question that I asked the members of the support group was, what is your diagnosis? And not one person in the room could articulate what their diagnosis was. They couldn't tell me what their receptor positive diagnosis was. They couldn't tell me their staging, nothing. The only thing they knew was that they had breast cancer. And so already there, we, we found that that is a huge challenge because how can you fight what you don't know? And so we had to take a step back and we had to not only educate the patients on their particular diagnosis, but then arm them with the necessary tools to play an active role in their disease journey. Next slide, please. Now, the first thing that we had to do is we had to take our patients essentially through a breast cancer 101 course and explain to them the different staging of breast cancer, um, the, dif the different um, immunohistochemistry of breast cancer. And then we had to actually have them bring in their pathology report and sit down, <coughs> excuse me, and sit down with them with a volunteer oncologist and explain their diagnosis to them for the very first time. And after that was done, then we had to get organized. And essentially what getting organized meant was giving each patient a notebook and a notebook where they could keep all of the documents because for those of us that are, work with patients, we know there's a litany of documentation that comes at them um, through every visit. And so they have to get organized. So we gave each of them a notebook and with dividers to explain to them, okay, this is where you put this test, this is where you put this information. So again, when they're going in to visit their doctor, they're going in armed with information. After we got them organized through their notebooks, then we had to make sure that they understood their diagnosis. Because like I, like I said earlier, there is a finite amount of time that each patient has to spend with their oncologist. And so they have to be very direct and they have to be respectful of this time. And naturally, if, a, if an oncologist sees that you're coming from an informed position, they're more likely to take that extra time to explain uh, information to you. So just going through some role-playing exercises with them as to what a normal appointment should look like. And then having them write down potential questions that they might have for their oncologist, and then also giving them questions that they could ask as well. And so we found that going through these role-playing exercises not only increased their confidence, but then also helped us to see where the gaps were and that some of the questions that we could answer right then and there. And then every time that we would have our support group meetings, we would practice, practice, practice. Again, just in a way to empower the patient, because not only did this help them understand their diagnosis, but it helped to erase some of the fear and, and the confusion that exists with the diagnosis. Some women through our support group meetings found out for the very first time the sort of breast cancer that they had was incurable. And while the, this news initially was very devastating, it was something that put them at peace because we had a patient that kept asking, when, when is my treatment over? When am I done with this? And just understanding that this was going to be a lifelong process, it kind of helped to put things into perspective for her. And while in the beginning, it was a very difficult pill to swallow, she gained peace in knowing what the entire journey um, could look like. So again, just to recap, what did we do with the patients? Firstly, we got them organized. Secondly, we made sure that they understood their diagnosis and then went through role play exercises to help them understand what questions they could ask and then have them think of particular questions to ask on their next appointments. Next slide. 
And by doing this, we saw a huge improvement in the understanding of the patients. Like I said at the beginning, we had patients who had no understanding of their diagnosis. The only thing that they knew was that they had breast cancer. But by the end of the program, 68% of the patients knew and understood their particular diagnosis. And not only that, by going through our breast cancer 101 crash course, they were able to articulate the difference between early stage breast cancer and their breast cancer, which is late stage breast cancer. And what we found was an overall increase in confidence in their treatment journey, but then also the need to play an active role. And not only were they playing an active role with themselves, they were also now mentoring other new patients that were entering the support group. So again, just giving them the tools that they needed to communicate with their doctors, increased confidence, and also increased their active their activity in their own uh, disease progression. Next slide, please. So essentially what I want us to take from this is to arm our patients with the necessary tools to ask questions of the doctors. And again, it's through practice, it's through role plays, and it's through getting them organized. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ibella. I think that was extremely helpful to, um, to, to countries, you know, which are like low and middle income countries, because this is where the problem lies sometimes when it comes to um, what, what do we do, particularly when it is a disease like breast cancer or cancer. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. it is breast cancer as such, uh, there is a lot of, there are a lot of issues. It's to do with women, it's to do with uh, not talking about it in public. It's to do with uh, not come bringing it out into the open in the among the family members. So there are many issues when it comes to uh, breast cancer and particularly communication. Uh, I I would li like to move into questions and answers now, but um, I hope the panel members are ready to take on some questions uh, for now. I would like to read up the question which is on the on the slider slide, which is most patients will ask whether they can be cured. Mm -hmm. How to communicate the fact to the patients that they are in advanced stage, especially to the terminal stage? Do we as volunteers and doctors have to tell the truth? Because in some cases, the family members are hiding the fact to the patients. Mm -hmm. I would like to start with Lucia first because you may have come across such issues as well in your work experience where there is this so-called conspiracy of silence that happens uh, in the family. <coughs> exactly, uh, Hanjit, and I would like to greet all, all the members of the panel. Uh, lovely to be with you discussing these issues. Yes, that's indeed uh, a tough issue because on the one hand, the patient is entitled to the information that they need, not the one that necessarily we need to give them, but the one that they want to have. Because sometimes the patient also says, well, I would like the doctor to uh, speak with uh, my daughter because she understands the words and I don't understand so much. So the first thing that the doctor needs to understand is who is the patient that I have in front of me and what does she need? What does she want? What are her preferences? Mm -hmm. uh, and not just to uh, speak uh, mm -hmm. everything to her mm -hmm. that she mm -hmm. doesn't, uh, has spoken that she needs and that she wants. So that's mm -hmm. why that protocol that I showed you, the SPIKES protocol, has a, has a step, and this is part of the communication trainings, um, skills training of the doctors, to let them know that before they say anything, they need to understand what the patient knows already about the disease. So Ebele was saying that many patients do not know, do not understand what is going on. So it's crucial to to understand what the patient already knows and to, uh, then to understand 
if she wants information and what kind of information too much a lot of information just uh, basic information etc so that is basic because the patient is the most important person we who the doctor relates with and everything needs to be be validated from the part of the of the patient and um, uh, no one can diminish the rights of the patient but the right of the patient is to express her own needs and rights what does she want then when the family comes with the this uh, conspiracy of silence, we need to understand that um, it's uh, a need to protect the patient. So we need to address their concerns. And usually the doctors say, oh, no, 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 no. I, I have to tell my patient what does she has. And um, that's not the best way to deal with it because the family knows the patient best. And it might happen that the patient is, has been very depressed or undergoing difficult situations. And so the family can provide crucial information to the doctor about what are the current problems of this patient and how can both family and doctor compromise to help this patient. Sometimes, the, as I was saying, the family explains that um, the patient has been suicidal. And we need to know this, this because most of the time, the patient will not disclose this information to the doctors. And so uh, we are having crucial information on how to handle this patient the best way. So what we can say is that, okay, that's very good that you tell me this. Let's, say, let's see what the patient wants and how, what the patient has already understood and how, what can we do from here. But I understand your need, so let's compromise on helping the patient the best way we can. So this is to say that we cannot push the family needs aside, not at all. We need the family to help this patient go the best way we can through their journey. But we need also to respect the needs of the patient and to compromise the three parties, the doctor, the patient and the family about what is the best way to help the patient through this journey. So it's more like a teamwork uh, amongst the three parties uh, as such to, to of course, some kind of, course. of uh, a more amicable uh, situation, actually. Uh, I, the other question actually is very much related to this, uh, where it says um, some family members prefer not to tell the elderly patient, like their parents, the truth about the cancer progression. And how do you look at this situation? Should we say all patients deserve to know nothing uh, but the truth, especially when it relates to your lives, to their lifespan. I think uh, Lucia had just answered that question uh, in a very clear way just now. Uh, do you want to add anything, Ibella and Rania, on this about truth telling and about the fact that Lucia has just mentioned about the teamwork between the Absolutely. doctor, the family, and the patient that helps to come to a, a better understanding of the situation in all aspects from all parties concerned and then move from there. Yeah, actually, if, if I may, um, I, I would start by saying no one size fits all. There is no uh, standard answer for this. And it's a very delicate and sensitive issue at the same time. So by hiding information, you're, you're taking from their rights. By mm -hmm. saying everything clearly, uh, like it's it's also very harsh and, and strong in some personalities, how you draw the balance. And uh, there are some cultures where uh, elderly patients think very strongly that they shouldn't share their disease uh, news or anything related to their disease with their, uh, with their kids, basically, to protect them. Um, and this needs to be respected because it puts a toll in their emotions. And um, on the other side, 
also caregivers or family members, if they know about very elderly that um, uh, they are the, the first line in talking with the nurses and doctors, uh, and they are afraid of the reaction of their mother or their father, if, if they got diagnosed with the breast cancer or metastatic, uh, to know for, for, for real. And actually there has been some research uh, discussing how denial has been a coping strategy. It's very mm -hmm. real for, for mm -hmm. some groups of the patients. It's just the denial. And if you tell them uh, like the, 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 the cruel fact, I would call it the cruel fact, it, it, would, um, it would mean for some patients to retreat and for other patients, they would appreciate this honesty. How, how to draw this balance? It's one by one cases, I, uh, uh, one by one case. I, I wouldn't... Uh, uh, give an advice that would fit for every patient because I have seen different types of patients. One patient would would ever want to know for real where is the cancer now, metastatic specifically, because that that gives that gives them a sense of less hope for for their mentality, for their upbringing, for their culture, and that's theirs. We cannot take that away from them or convince them otherwise after this much time. I, I had that, that conversation was with one of the patients and I said, you are the most important person for you in the world. You need to speak out. You need to, to tell us about your needs. You need to speak to the oncologist. I would help you. And she said, I am a shy person and I cannot change now. It's too late for me. I'm over 65. So that that's, was an eye opener for me. We cannot change them. We need to be just very appreciative of who they are and try to feel their pain they really face lots layers of pain and I, I have uh, the full empathy and full respect for them. Um, and there is no easy answer, I'm afraid. Thank you, Rania. Hey, Bella, do you have uh, any, any opinion in this? Well, I, I know that we struggled with this in the beginning, especially because none of our patients knew that they had metastatic breast cancer. And in our culture, you cannot speak definitively really about life and death. And so you can't say to somebody, you're going to die because naturally they're going to say, well, you're not God, you don't know that. Exactly. And so by challenging that, you sort of short circuit any form of communication. So we have to be uh, sensitive and understanding about the cultural aspects of dealing with our patients. That being said, I asked Fatima, um, you know, in the beginning, how do we broach this subject with our patients? Because we felt that they need to know that their, their breast cancer is incurable. And she said to me, firstly, do not lie. You cannot lie to patients. But outside of that, you have to give them this information in doses in the sense that it's not on your first meeting with the patient that you say you have incurable breast cancer, you know, you're going to live with this your entire life, you're going to be fighting with it. No, but at every interaction that you have with the patient, you have to start opening them up to the understanding of what metastatic breast cancer is and just do it in doses. Um, so that you don't scare them away and so that they do come back. And so I think that's that if I'm going to add anything, that's that's what I'll add. Don't don't lie and be aware of the cultural aspects of uh, dealing with your patients. Thank you. I add something, Ranjit. Um, one of the advices that we give doctors in this dialogue is to use the words that uh, patients use. So if uh, when uh, doctors ask, do you have any idea about what is you're going through, um, you have to understand what kind of words the patient mm -hmm. uses. And sometimes you cannot use the word cancer. You have to say you have a, um, a tumor or, or you have a growth or you have a complicated disease that we need to treat. And this is going to make you, uh, will require you to be persistent because this treatment is going to be like this and that, like that. And then ask, uh, wait for questions from patients because if the patients want to know more, they will ask. And if they don't want, and if they, they have taken all that they needed, they will stop and they say, no, it, it's okay, please continue. So we have to, as you, you both you're saying, we have to be 
very attentive of, about what, uh, what does this patient need? What are their ways of thinking about what may be happening to them? And of course, helping them to understand, as Abel was saying, what is going on because they need to understand this is a complicated disease because otherwise they will uh, come apart from their doctors. I have in some decades ago uh, related with patients that did not know that they had cancer and they were very angry with their doctors because this is a bad doctor. I'm not getting better while they were in the hospital. I'm not getting any better, so this doctor is not uh, good. So I need to change my doctor. We don't want this to happen. So the communication needs to be clear, but clear, as you're saying, fitted to what the patient can manage. Because sometimes, um, uh, I remember a, an old patient and you were discussing elder, elderly patients. Those are the ones that have more difficulty with words because I have come across, even in my culture, uh, Western culture here in Europe, some patients that do not like to use the word cancer. Yes, they call it disease. That, that brings so many ideas, uh, negative ideas uh, to their mind that they cannot cope just with the idea uh, in their mind. They can cope. So some of them say, well, I know that this disease is complicated, but I just uh, need to know the, the little, as little as possible. I will be collaborative. I know that this is complicated, but please don't tell me everything because then I will have um, in my mind this strong idea and I cannot cope with it. So we need to be very cautious with the words and that's why doctors cannot just say you have cancer, we have found this and that because that's too much. That's why they need to have steps to understand what the patient, the way the patients express their vocabulary, what they know, what they want, and then adapt what uh, they need to know as to undergo the treatment peacefully and always be open from the side of the doctors to questions that patients may have. Usually in the first consultation, they don't have many questions because they are a little bit in shock with already having something. But we need to be available throughout the process, doctors, nurses, and all the personnel to the patient's questions. So we have to uh, teach our doctors our organizations and our patients to be better skilled to uh, give a to optimize the outcome for the patients. Thanks, Lucia. And just let me remind you, remind the speakers that you have 433 people listening to you today. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> That's a wonderful audience. Congratulations for the topic that was yeah. topic that was selected for this session, actually. And I think that it's a much needed topic and that is why the Southeast Asian people are listening on. And uh, we, we, we have another question here. Uh, and I think that is not new to many of you. Um, I think we have covered this question. Can we go to the next question? How to get the doctor's attention with a long queue of patients I think we know that our doctors sometimes have 100 patients waiting outside. Uh, but then again, how much time do you need with the doctor for a more effective sort of session? And for me, it's also to do with if you have a psycho-oncologist available, that's very helpful as well. Often notes that have been prepared from home cannot be disclosed. I don't quite understand this. Uh, one of the things that often bothers me is feeling nervous and confused when listening to the doctor's explanation. I think that comes to what Lucia had mentioned about doctors being sensitive about the, do the patient's language, the patient's, uh, how the patients are feeling, the tone and the, the verbal and nonverbal communication. And I would like to just ask um, Ibella to start with, because I know Ibella that in your country and countries like mine, there's usually a long queue waiting for the doctor. 
and then we'll go to Lucia and Rania. Okay. Okay. Um, that's a great question. And it's a very practical question. Um, despite all of the talking that we're doing, when we whittle it down to the practicality, doctors simply, especially in my region, which I, which Ron, uh, Ron you said it's, it's a lot like your region. They simply do not have time. We have doctors in, in, you know, they have like a thousand patients that they have to see. So it's just not practical to ask them to spend any more time with the patient. That's where you see the necessity of patient navigators and advocacy groups come in because they are going to be the ones that kind of shore up where the doctors can't. And that's just, that's just being honest. Um, outside of that, what we have found with our patients, if you go in informed, you are more likely to get the doctor's attention because already there, they know that you have some background, you have some reference. So they're not having to start, so to speak, from the very bottom and, and go all the way up. So just going in, you know, speaking the terminology, dropping particular key words will show the doctor that you are informed. And naturally, they're going to pay more attention if it's possible to answering that question. So sometimes it is difficult to ask the questions that you have written down on your way home because it's a perfect scenario. You're like, I'm gonna ask this question, I'm gonna ask that question. And then when you finally get in front of the doctor, they're rushing you and you become a, a nervous mess and abandon all of the notes that you wrote. So that's fine. I always tell my patients, go in with one or two very hot, topic burning questions, because more than likely you're not going to get a list of questions answered. And then any other questions that you might have, that's where the patient navigator or the nurse navigator can come in and answer those, those questions. But your hot topic questions, usually are going to be one or two for the doctors. Ask those and any other additional questions that you might have, that's where your nurse navigator or patient navigator will come in. So, you know, the educator in me always repeats my answer. And so the long and short of it is go in with keywords and terminology. It will get the doctor's attention. Thank you, Bella. Lucia? So well, I would say that the, the role of the NGOs in training patients to have a more clear focus about the time and how they can use it in the consultation is crucial. As Abel was saying, uh, and we were mentioning during this uh, workshop, it's important that patients also receive training to understand what, what are the broad issues that they are facing. And then when they go to the, to the consultation, bring their agenda very specific. So what do I need? Sometimes I'm, I'm feeling with side effects that are making my life difficult. So it's not only about questions, it's also about reporting how am I feeling. So uh, narrow your focus and uh, place that down in the consultation. But it also helps to get your doctor's attention to say, well, doctor, I know that you are a very busy person, <laughs> but I would like you to pay attention, but I would like you to uh, know that I'm going through this and I would need you to ask these questions. Uh, because the doctors also, having such a file of, of patients, also need also some consideration and some empathy, and that helps, as well as also bring someone with you to the consultation, because Patients are so anxious for through that moment that most of the times they do not even uh, get everything uh, that they they need to to then remember. So it's crucial to have someone that can help them to remind about what the doctor has said. Uh, Rania, few more words from you. Sure. Uh, this is um, uh, first. Uh, th thanks for everyone watching us. And these are really very critical questions, not not easy ones. Um, 
I would say education for patients is very important and navigators and patient advocates are extremely important, but in some parts of the world, this is a luxury that even patients cannot afford. In the Middle East, I, I would speak of my organization, Fadia Survive and Thrive, we're based in, in Switzerland, but our activities in Kuwait and Egypt. I'm from Egypt myself, uh, but being based in Kuwait, um, in the Middle East in general, it's, it's uh, patient advocacy or patient advocate is not even a terminology that it's recognized. It's perceived as if you are a spy on oncologist or mm -hmm. what, what is it that you, what, that you want, as if you're wanting to do something. So mm -hmm. it's very legitimate question. And, and actually everyone goes through cancer, whatever the phase, metastatic or primary, during treatment, outpatient, uh, uh, during a chemotherapy, there are questions and none of these are naive. And it's very normal to feel irritated or nervous about them because it's the first time you hear about these very complex uh, life-threatening issues. And you need to, as I said in the communication gaps, like you have the full attention, you need to understand. But unfortunately, there is a limitation on the time of oncologists and that where education and patient advocates need to intervene. So uh, let me take the opportunity through the platform of this conference to encourage all organizations to have a voice for patient advocate. It will make your life more easier as oncologists or doctors because they will do this uh, little education of the basics and then you can take it from there. It will save the time and it's mm -hmm. there is we cannot um, um, exclude that part of knowledge from the patient uh, to, uh, to, to save the, uh, the, the time of the oncologist. It's a must know, uh, no matter how naive it's perceived in the beginning. Thank so you. yeah, it's an important question. Thanks for whoever asked it. I think there's plenty of work to be done for most of our countries. There's uh, how much yeah. training and communication we have for medical students or even nursing students in our are these important in their examinations or they are just one chapter or, or just two hours of training? Uh, all these needs to be looked into for future in most of your countries. You could be patient advocates to advocate for proper training in communication skills for your healthcare professionals. There's also more work to be done in terms of quality of life versus quantity of life, whether mm -hmm. it's how to live or how long to live are the two issues that the question mark comes in. And there's a dilemma on that. And then what about patients who give up and they say they want to, you know, they, they just don't want to live anymore. I think these are, these are food for thought for future for groups in your own countries to start discussing, to talk about, and then maybe bring it up in future con conferences. So right now, I would like to conclude this session by just putting a few points that I have gathered from our speakers. We have what Lucia uh, and Rania had also given was that the two to do with resources, uh, particularly with communications with the healthcare professionals. I think Lucia had listed down a long list of resources for that and training in communication skills for healthcare professionals and that includes nurses and doctors. I think here in Malaysia, in some of the uh, doctors, uh, the medical students do come for training to us in communication skills and we being patient advocates, we are giving them the training in spikes and having a dialogue with them, having role plays with them and I think it works really well to see how the, the reverse is happening where patient groups are actually doing the training from their point of view and that is being valued in some of the universities. The other one of course is um, uh, while the emphasis is on technical skills of healthcare professionals, they also need to develop soft skills, which can help them a great deal in their communication. And um, the other one is, of course, health literacy for public. I think Ibella spoke a little bit. Rania also spoke about health literacy uh, in giving confidence to the patients and also uh, communication tools for patients that help patients to make the communication scenario a bit more comfortable for both and easier for both and and they can get the best out of their session with their doctors and uh, i think practical tips is what we can come up with to give to patients as well and uh, with that i would like to thank my panel speakers i would like to thank uh, the abc global alliance and breast cancer welfare association for organizing this session and um, also to thank the um all of the audience that we've had for today's session. I know Ibella has woken up very early in the morning. Uh, if you had joined us in this morning session, it would have been last night for you. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I know Lucia, it's also morning time for you. Uh, Rania, you yes. should be morning for you. Where are you from? Uh, it's yeah, it's noon now, so it's not that bad. <laughs> right, just before lunchtime. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank all those who have been working in the background, the technical people for this, yes. and also the uh, the Indonesian Breast Cancer Foundation for allowing us to have this session. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank, thank you. you thank you for having us. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you, thank you all yeah. and everyone. Right. Thank Bye -bye. you to the audience as well. You, well. you need a trip to Indonesia to, to see the country. Yeah. And, and Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.